Hello, podcast listeners. My name is Kelly Richardson Lawson. I'm a mother, a wife, and an entrepreneur. I started the Sunrise Project after our beautiful teenage son attempted to take his own life. Truth is, I'm tired. My husband and I felt despair, isolation, and immeasurable pain. I knew in my heart we needed a place for Black parents to share their struggles, find mutual support, and help our beloved children who struggle with mental wellness, addiction, or both. Each weekly podcast features an expert who shares their knowledge and takes questions from parents and children. Take me to the king. I don't have much to bring. The Sunrise Project allows Black families, like ours, to find comfort in knowing that we are not alone. While the purpose of the Sunrise Project is to share, support, and uplift, this conversation is not a substitute for medical advice. Finding the right healthcare professional for your family's specific needs is crucial. If you do not feel seen or heard, you should speak to more than one professional to find the right fit. Good morning, everybody. Really happy that you're here. And just want to remind everyone, this is our safe space of solace. And hopefully we can find some peace with one another as we share and learn in a way that's filled with love, compassion, and mutual desire to heal our families and ourselves. So I'll open up with the serenity prayer, and then I'll turn it over to our um, guest uh, moderator this week. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I'm thrilled to introduce you to Sharon Green. Um, Sharon is uh, has been inspired by her own 12-year personal journey with her own three young men, African-American young men. She has a very unique and powerful insight into the challenges that families face with our children. And she has also recognized how extensive the void is in meeting the social and emotional needs of our children who are struggling to have their voices heard. So I am delighted to introduce you to Sharon. She and I have become friends rapidly over the past several months, and she's helped me with some of our um, challenges in our family, and I'm going to turn it over to her to share her story and to answer questions and have a conversation. So Sharon? Yes, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Thank you so much for introducing me. And also, I wanted to just say uh, our topic today really stems from us as children. And now we have given birth to children that we have transferred some of our own traumas that we have not healed. And so today is not just about how do we as parents parent through trauma, but more so how do we heal our traumas and then be able to recognize and heal our children. Um, So I wanted to start with the first and foremost is that we as adults have come about who we are to learn about who we are, how we show up based on our parents and the eras that we've uh, grown up in generationally. So if you were a 60s child, a 70s child, 50s child, the holistic approach to how you were raised is looking at the community, looking at the environment, looking at politically and socially how we were at that period of time, um, how family was looked at, and also um, what was important in your immediate family and community. And so now when I'm talking about the trauma in our children, we also have to recognize the era that we're raising them in. What are the uh, economic and social factors in that area, community and family, and how it has changed over the years and Oftentimes, we're trying to hold on to it. So what do I mean by uh, the trauma that we've had within? First and foremost, you know, trauma is defined by the person that is receiving it. And so we also say, oh, you know, that wasn't a bad thing, or you'll be able to get over it. But it's individualized. Oftentimes, we will look and say, oh, that's not so bad, but for a child, or a young adult, you just never understand what impact it could be. 
so I remember my son, uh, middle son, wanted a dog really, really bad. Uh, we traveled often, uh, you know, just road trips around, and their dad did not want to be inconvenienced by a dog. And so he said, well, why don't we get a goldfish? So he got a, several goldfish, and he put it in, set it up, and made my son very excited about it. One of the things they forgot to tell him is the lifespan of goldfish do not last long. And so we went away for a day or two, fed the fish, had made a whole excited, you know, preparation for the fish. We come back and the fish died. And he cried and cried and cried and cried and cried. And the impact for us was like, oh my gosh. We had no idea. And to this day, he never got his dog. He didn't want another replacement of the goldfish. And he said when he became an adult, which he is now, he's going to have 10 dogs. And he would not engage with any other animal. He didn't want to be connected to it because he was so connected to it. And so that's a minor situation. However, it was a traumatic effect for him and how he now reacts and interacts with animals. He likes to look at them, but he's just like, nope, I don't want to be bothered. And it's nice to see, but I don't want to have any part of it. So when we look at teenagers, especially, we say to ourselves, wow, oh, you can get over that. Oh, your friend had a car accident. They lived, right? Aren't you excited? But you never understand what that traumatic effect will, will do to the children. And oftentimes, we are not in a position to really understand the impact because we're dealing with our own day-to-day. And so today, I just want to speak to you all of what are some of the trauma effects that happen to teenagers and adolescents and what we can do as parents to acknowledge it and know when we can be disciplinary, when we can just be there to listen or if we need to take it to another level to get a clinical psychologist or MSW behavior specialist in on it to deal with it because of how they have internalized the information and um, are doing illicit behaviors to them. So parenting a child with trauma who has experienced it. When children are receiving trauma in their lives, as I said, oftentimes, they will shut down emotionally at that pace. It could be divorce, a death of a friend or a family member, a teacher, a pet, a sibling, or a community member that they are close to, someone in their church. And so when these triggers happen, oftentimes we do not put things in place to make them have a safe place to talk. And so I'm encouraging you all to, when these things happen, to immediately, if you're not able to do it, to find a way that these children and teenagers are placed in a safe place. And I don't mean that you have to take them somewhere. I mean that they are in a a situation where they can talk it out, cry it out, release any emotions that they're needing in their lives at that particular time. The studies have found that these uh, stressors in early in their lives, uh, parents are often not able to understand it. And when they have finally figured it out based on their anger or using drugs or doing other illicit behaviors to themselves, oftentimes you are not realizing it, the impact of what someone or some situation happened for them. So for instance, um, in high school especially, when uh, students uh, might commit suicide, a teacher might die of a heart attack suddenly or be diagnosed with a a particular disease or a parent who has been diagnosed or there is a divorce. Those are major, major triggers and It is important. I know we want to push through and let them have as normal a life as possible, but oftentimes it's very, very important 
to take a moment and sit back. And if you don't have the wherewithal, there are people who can do it. In schools, uh, middle school and high school, there are grief counselors, there are professional counselors, and then there are teachers who are equipped to have those kinds of conversations. Another thing around trauma is, is that um, a study has been shown that severe childhood trauma and stresses early in the child's life has been connected to the parent's lifeline. And it, if a parent has had trauma in their life when they were younger, in their childhood or in their teenage lives, and it has not been acknowledged or recognized or healed, oftentimes there's going to be higher rates that the behavioral uh, problems will go into their own children. And that is the connection between mother and child. And so when a mother has not healed her own wounds, those experiences have adverse effects on the child. Very rarely in these studies have they seen that it's been connected to the father's experiences. And so when we are giving birth to our beautiful children, oftentimes, our feelings, our energy is transferred right over to our children. And if we are frustrated, disappointed, and concerned about uh, just maintaining a daily to day life of survival mode, or we're working really hard, we have a tendency to be extremely stressed. And our children feel that. Have you ever had your daughter or son come up to you when they were? Mommy, are you okay? Mommy, it's going to be okay. That stems from them feeling that energy from you. And, you know, you look at them and you're just like, oh, I'm fine. There's nothing wrong. They might not be able to articulate it at that point, but they do understand. And then when they become teenagers, they too are still feeling your energy and allowing that to seep in within themselves. And so with the studies that have been presented, they said that the traumas in these students' lives are also connected genetically. The next thing is, is that how do they act out and why do they act out? And what do we do as parents to allow them to have a safe place to release that energy, emotions, and stuff? And so what, is, what do we mean by acting out? They might fight. They might fleet. They might freeze up, not wanting to talk. Uh, they might want to get into a dangerous and illicit behaviors, high-risk behaviors, and that could be drugs and alcohol, sex, and or just high-risk behaviors, driving cars really fast, and doing a lot of different things that would bring harm to them. And so, well, you can't be in a situation that you're allowing children just to, well, teenagers and young adults to run amok. That's not what we're looking at. But what we're looking at is what is the root cause of the situation? Oftentimes in my coaching practice, you know, my parents will come and say, oh, this is for middle schoolers and high schoolers. Oh, they're lazy. Oh, they, you know, talking back or oh, they sleep too much. And so I redirect them and say, well, how old is the student? And if they're between the ages of about 11 to 16, we talk about growth, development, puberty. And for boys, they might sleep a lot more. For girls, they might be awkward, have pain, menstrual cycle coming on so that they're very moody. And I ask the parents, are you acknowledging that these are the things that are happening? And sometimes just in the busy day-to-day -day and all this kind of stuff, they're like, oh, yeah. And so we kind of reevaluate what is going on with the kids. Sometimes we're so busy in our day-to-day -day activities that we just don't acknowledge it. That doesn't mean that you, you don't know that it's not happening. You understand that it's happening. However, we are often looking at not we're looking at the immediate what's in front of us as opposed to what has built up. So our kids now are preteens and teenagers, and they're going through their teenage brain. The frontal lobe is wide open, high-risk behaviors are coming, and then the third parent comes in. 
and we have mom and dad, or we have uh, family that is uh, parenting them. And what do I mean by the third family? Social media and or their peers. What their peers and social media says in the 21st century dictates how they operate. The third parent model oftentimes can have more impact during their teenage years than parents and or siblings and other aspects of the community that is raising them. And so how do we as parents deal with that? Because they are constantly on their phones and they're looking for approval from their peers and direction on what they should do. So I often say to families, what is the goal? How are we going to use this tool as a support system and not as a negative in the family? So we set times of when you have phone time. Then you say, well, as a teenager, I can't control that. Well, you can set the tone of what's priority in your house. Um, oftentimes, I might recommend there's a box that's at the door. And for the first hour, when you come in, you can't use your phone. No phone at the table when you're eating dinner, or even if you're not having dinner at the table during that period of time that everyone is grabbing and going and having meals because uh, they have all these other schedules, there's no phone time. And then nighttime, after a certain hour, it's turned in. And you say, well, that's not always available. It's hard to do. This is when you know that you have to start being a disciplinarian and put it down. And oftentimes the kids will say, well, you keep your phone. Well, it's not about what you're doing. It's about how you are put, helping them set healthy boundaries for themselves. And the third parent also has um, a way of them reaching out and supporting. I shared how social media actually saved my son's life. My oldest son is bipolar, and he had the opportunity to use the social media for a cry for help. I was completely out of sorts about it because as a parent, you know, I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, how are you putting this on? But for him, it was a sense of validation and understanding how many people actually loved him, and he felt connected. And so because of that connection that he felt, it gave him a new sense of vitality. And it wasn't that he was no longer depressed, but it was, wow, I had no idea. So then I started looking at how does this social media piece or tool that we are using or feeling so negative about because it has such an impact, how is it that we can use it to our advantage? And what are we looking at? And so I've encouraged parents who do not follow their kids to follow their kids. And also just kind of, of sometimes friends and look for code words. And you might not be the direct person to give that information, but you might say, oh, talk to your son. I saw that so-and-so was saying this. How do you feel about that? What does that look like? Because they still might not understand that that's a cry for help or that there's some illicit behaviors that need to be addressed. The next piece is outside of the third parent is looking at how does the traumatic effect last with the student for ongoing time? And what do I mean by that? When a major incident happens, what is the plan that parents have to allow the child to work through the process? So what has happened in the high schools often is that students will either die from a car accident, drug overdose, or a suicide attempt that was successful. How are you communicating with your student around that? What are you putting in place? to allow that student to go somewhere and share their information. We never understand the impact of what those incidents will do. Even if it's not a person that is their best friend, it could be just an associate, someone in the school. Oftentimes the school will do an immediate response of grief counseling and talking about it. 
but it's important for us to acknowledge at home and to take the time to allow the student to have a safe place to start the conversation. When the student starts acting out, that's when we start asking questions. But if we are proactive on the front end in having conversations of when things are impacting them directly and indirectly, that is a precursor that maybe, okay, they will not act out on themselves. So now let's go to, you've done all of these things. You've shared all of this information. You've been proactive and still the child just runs amok. How do you parent through the trauma of a child who is running amok? The first thing is acknowledgement. Acknowledging that there is a problem. Acknowledging that it could be a chemical imbalance, it could be physiological, it could be emotional, it could be neurological. When we are looking at our kids, we are just saying, oh, he's just acting out. No, oftentimes there are things going on that now they don't know how to control it. And so the first thing I would recommend is that you see your doctor. I have a client whose student went from straight A's to apps. I've been working with this young lady for a period of time. And when I say straight A's to apps, it was a matter of two months. That should be a major trigger. I immediately asked her to take her daughter to the doctor. And she was like, okay. And why did I say go to the doctor? I knew that it was puberty time. I knew that there were some other dynamics going on in the classroom that needed to be addressed. And I wanted her to go to her doctor so that she could have availability to talk to the, a person who was trained, had a trained ear, someone who could do a physical to see what was going on, and then to just kind of come up with a game plan. And sure enough, the student was having a focus issue and the student was, I call it soft bullying, being ostracized. And so we don't see our kids for eight hours a day, and they don't often tell us what's going on. And so the peer pressures and the things that are going on in their lives, if we don't have an open line of communication, they just go within. And that's where social media, the third parent comes in. You start to see and hear how they're acting out. The second thing that we looked at was, how we communicate to our kids, how we are to not to lash out, not make the student wrong for their behavior. Often you times you will be shocked by what was the impact of the child's reasons for acting out. It could have been that they felt that you were not giving them attention. It could be that they felt their sibling was getting more attention, even though they felt they were getting attention, but their sibling was, you know, doing all the right things and they were just running amok. Or it could be the impact of whatever emotional thing is going on in the home. So we have to kind of look and say to ourselves, how is this impacting each child? And it will do it differently. One child might go within, another child will act out, Another child might use it as a way to release on the, the athletic field or in their creative spirits, whether they're doing poetry or singing or writing songs. Each of us will release the pain of the trauma in very different ways. And as parents, it is important for you to parent each child differently for the exact same trauma. And that's a lot. So as a coach, what I often will do is ask the parents, what is your goal in parenting? How do you want to see your child live their purpose and passion in life? And looking at how these traumatic effects have dictated in their lives for a long period of time or a short period of time. It's their journey. So when a student is using drugs and alcohol, it is not that they're just wilding out. There's something that they're covering. And what is it that they're covering? And how you as a parent, you are 
really afraid because you don't want them to OD. You don't want them to create a situation where they might go steal for it or just really, you know, let it become an addiction for them. So the conversations have to be open with you and saying, not so much, why are you doing this and what's going on? You know, you're doing a bad thing. It's more of what was the core reason that made it happen. And sometimes the kids might say, well, it was fun. And then you say, okay, well, why are you still doing it? Well, I like it and I want to continue doing it. But if you keep talking to them, you'll find out the pain of what happened initially to them. And even if they don't start drinking or smoking until age 17 or 18, the trauma effect could have been at age 10. So you have to really keep the lines of communication open for them to say, you know, I don't like what I'm doing and I really want help, but this is what's happened to me. And this is why I feel this way. And I do know with these issues that have come up, oftentimes parents are are shocked to know how something happened 10, 12 years prior to the child acting out at age 17 or 18. And you're saying, I had no idea. What I want to do now is open it because most of our students are adolescents and young adults uh, to questions on anything that I've shared or things that I can answer or at least ref- and if I can't answer it, refer you to someone that can help. And Sharon, I would ask just before um, someone else jumps in, some of our uh, parents are parents of young adults, so college students or former college students. And I'm wondering, are, are the principles the same? And how can parents who have children that are, you know, in their early 20s or even late 20s, how can we help talk to our children when they're not under 18? Well, there there's a little bit of a challenge because they're not a child anymore and so you really have to get permission from them especially if you want to take them to the doctor or the medical doctor or clinical psychologist so it is a different conversation in having with them so we often have to say okay how can i communicate with my young adult child colleges um all colleges have programs and services that they are in tune on how to assist the kids. Uh, it's usually they're called CAPS, and it's a counseling program um, where they will be able to acknowledge that the student is going through something. And what I have often recommended to parents is that they can call the program and they can call the psychologist and they can tell them that these are the concerns and these are the things. And what the college will do is send someone and kind of look out for them and talk to them or ask their advisors, have they seen any behavior that would warrant them to have, a, uh, to bring the student in. Uh, also, if their grades are, are plummeting, oftentimes they will acknowledge it. They will not call you directly, but if you have already reached out to them, then that's a, a plus. If your student is not in school or has dropped out of school, Maybe, you know, you can have conversations with the student to go to counseling and so that they can, you know, share in a safe place what's going on. They don't like to do that. So because then, you know, that labels them. Uh, Coaches often will then um, be another uh, way to go because they don't feel like it's, you know, that they're going through, they're setting goals in the coaching program as opposed to there's something clinically wrong with them. Uh, licensed coach, uh, certified coaches are not licensed therapists nor psychologists, and uh, sometimes they might have referral uh, to say, you know, this is out of my purview, but we will um, work in tandem with a psychologist. The most important and critical piece is, is to create a safe space to not lash out and it's hard and so sometimes the parent has to also be 
in counseling or coaching to help them help their children. Also, I wanted to just say, when your child is watching you go through a devastating time, and it could be based on dis-ease, or it could be based on divorce, or it could just be your own mental health stresses. I cannot stress to you all enough on how that impacts our children. No matter how much we try to keep it away from them, you know, as far as being quiet or uh, don't share, they innately feel what's going on. And so that's why we have to keep the open line of communication because their acting out is based on what they're not getting in some form or fashion from a parent, sibling, or at their home life. But I cannot stress to you enough, as much as we try to shield our children from our own personal stressors in life and pain and agony, they feel it so much. So it's so important for us to acknowledge to them age appropriately of what is going on with you because they feel it. I have a question. Do you know what you really, really want for your young adults? What is it that you want for them and that you don't see happening now and you need tools or support and how to make that happen? And the reason why I ask this question is one of the questions I ask in my uh, coaching model. We never take the time to really sit down and think about what we really, really want. And if we started there and be very intentional about it, then we would know what the triggers are that are coming in their lives. So say to yourself, hmm, I want to have an emotionally healthy child. I want a child to grow into understanding their purpose and passion in life. I want my child to be able to live their authentic self unapologetically. I want my child to live their truth at all costs. I want my child to be able to define their own success and I support them through it. I want my child to know how to value themselves. I want my child to be a risk taker in a healthy and formidable way. I want my child to be self-reliant. I want my child to be able to celebrate their present moment. I want my child to have a peaceful life. I want my child to be able to experience a lifetime of wellness. I want my child to fulfill their higher needs and to feel a sense of purpose. Do you notice that I didn't say I want my child to have great grades? I want my child to be a great athlete. Oftentimes, the pressures of society, expectations of our community and family want us to be driven in a way of success that sets off from the real way of how we want our our lives to be. So we're driven, 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 driven. And so the traumas, in life that come our way, we're just, oh my gosh, I can't believe your grades are not good. You didn't go to school. You cut classes. You were mean. But if we were to look at the things that I just said about the character and about the support of who that human being is becoming and that person that we are responsible for, we would be able to see the triggers of the trauma, I believe, a little easier. So what do I mean by live your authentic self or live your truth? If you're talking like that to your child, guess what? Their grades are going to be great. So you will know if your child is a straight A student, a great B student, or a wonderful C student, and you would be okay with that. And then. You say to yourself, okay, why are you making these high-risk behaviors? It's not that you don't want your child to take risks, because absolutely you want them to be able to be free, but you're not trying to get them to jump into drugs. But if you 
look at it and you start to talk to them and have that open line of communication, if they were interested in taking drugs, you would be able to have a conversation with them. That would be non-threatening. I know it sounds crazy, but there's not a teenager in this world that is not going to be pressured to not drink or smoke or both. But if you're working on that student being their truest self and understanding what those things are and what they will do to them, and you have an open line of communication, as foreign as it might sound, they will come home and say, you know what, I went to this party and they were drinking and I didn't want to be there. It does happen. Or mom, I went to this party and they were drinking and I really wanted some. What do you think about that? And you might be like, what? But if you're having conversations about being your true self, a lifetime of wellness, these are things that now allow you to have conversations. So the traumas of life are no longer traumas. They're just situations that are presented to us, and we are teaching our children how to resolve it. The trauma is when we ignore it, or placate it and put a Band-Aid over it, and it gets to fester, and we're just trying to make do. So now I'm going to ask the question again. What do you really, really want for your child, young adult, at this stage? Yeah, I would say I think probably all of us want our children to be healthy, loving, kind individuals that fulfill their passion and purpose, as you said. I would like to add that also for uh, for our child to find peace uh, as they define peace and resilience uh, to be able to make it through the lumps and bumps of life. I think when my child was younger, I had this thought of achievement-oriented goals. But then I saw what was going on out there with our boys, and um, I've switched over. You know, I just want them to be healthy. When I hit the crisis point, all of that achievement didn't seem to be important. You know, just getting him to be a whole and healthy adult was the most important thing. And it just allowed me to refocus and be honest about, you know, what the child in front of me, all of his beautiful gifts and talents, as opposed to those that were in my mind. Yeah. And and in your mind and in all of our minds, right? Because right. we want our kids to be successful, right? And right. then when they have these bumps, you know, all of a sudden you're checked. Like, okay, this really doesn't matter. Right. It's, <laughs> those A's. <laughs> it really, you know, and also, honestly, because, because Sharon, I see parents that are um, like myself and like you and like the people on this call, each and every day, who are going through, you know, really bad situations. And it just really centers your attention on what's mm-hmm. really important. Mm-hmm. For me, I just want my child to feel like genuine joy. Mm-hmm. I, I remember as a, as a younger child, you know, pre maybe 11, 12 even, there was genuine inner giggle, mm-hmm. right, to, to see that again. And to have my child feel that again, I think would be such a win for for the mother of a child with, you know, high levels of anxiety um, and just trying to get through every day. It would be really nice to have that, like, genuine joy. And so, you know, we we are in a society now of children with high anxiety, depression, masking it with drugs. taking um, high-risk behaviors, being, you know, just really outwardly negative in their ways. Um, And we all know that those are a cry for help. But we're still caught up in the day-to-day. But what happens if you just said, you know what, son, you have all this anxiety. We're just going to take a month off. No school, no nothing. You just stay with nature and do your thing, and I'm going to do it with you. And then you say, and, you know, if that's a recommendation, you say, well, I got to go to work. I can't do that. I, whatever. But oftentimes it, we get to such a catastrophic moment that we're forced to take that day or that month or 
uh, period of time to just reset and reconnect with our students. And while it's unprecedented to say, oh my gosh, I can't do it. Oftentimes, if you're forced to do it, what happens is I, you say to yourself, I can't believe I didn't do this earlier. And I know we have to eat, but I'm also here to say that there are only 11 at one time. There are only 15 for a year. There are only 20 for a year. And if we could just press that reset button, it really allows for them to take that moment and say, wow, it's not easy. The sacrifices are unreal. As mothers, we oftentimes want to do it, but we can't. And so what I would like to encourage you all is to look at creative ways that you could take a reset button. Maybe it's just a weekend. Maybe it's pulling them all out of sports. Maybe it's pulling them all out of uh, their activities. Maybe it's just you go to school, get your work, and come home. Maybe it's take a mental health time period. In boarding schools, you can do that. In private schools, you can do that. Not always in public schools. But I want to encourage you all, and and even in college, long is gone of you graduate in four years. It might be just a reset button. Any comments or questions? I do want to say this, um, and I alluded to it earlier. As we're going through the trauma of parenting our young adults who have mental, emotional, and uh, spiritual traumas going on in their life, it is important that you get the support that you need through either clinical psychologist, coach, or a psychiatrist, um, a behavioral specialist, a clergy person, that you have someone that you can talk to and get guidance so that you are full and ready when the triggers and the child or the young adult is acting out. Because when you're in that crisis mode, you need to be in your most calm spirit and that you not take it personal. When you are in your most calm spirit, you are able to hear what is going on. But if you're frustrated and flustered, you are not going to be able to pull on the tools that have been given to you to know when this situation happened. So for me, my oldest son, who's bipolar, he loves to dance. And there were times when he was in school and even at work now, now he's 24, would call me and I would hear his voice very, very sad, crying and doesn't want to cry, can't control it. And I would say, okay, let's FaceTime. And we would just dance. Sometimes it would be 10, 15 minutes. And I've also danced with him for an hour because I knew that's what he needed. But I was in a calm state because I had you know, meditated and also been in my own counseling to know that when he called, I didn't know what was going to be on the other line, but I'd be ready and available. So one of the things that I could do was convince him to dance. Because when you are in your depressed mode, you need to build your endorphins and get moving. And so I was like, okay, let's dance. Let's dance. Now that might not be your thing, but if you are being supported in your own way on how to deal. When these triggers come and the trauma is real and you're in the midst and thick of it, you can be in your calmest state. But if you're not getting the support for your personal self, it will not, not work. I guarantee it. And I'm sure most of you on this line would be able to give a testimony to that. You have to self-care. All right. Anybody have any comments? Any last comments before we close? Thank you. Wonderful. Well, I just want to say thank you uh, to Sharon Green, who's here today, and Mother Paul. I would like to 
closing prayer. Sometimes when there is nothing else that we can do, we must just stand in the presence of God and accept. Other times there are options, but we don't know what they are. Again, we must just stand in the presence of God and discern. Sometimes we know what to do, but must summon the courage. Again, we stand in the presence of God and pray for strength. I want to thank the woman who, um, a dear friend actually from Cincinnati who sent me those words. They really helped me. So thank you for sharing. And thank you for everybody who called in today for this week's call. Appreciate you. Appreciate all of you. Have a wonderful day. Everybody get some rest. And uh, we'll talk to you again next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Kelly Richardson Lawson, and you've been listening to the Sunrise Project podcast. You can follow Sunrise wherever you listen to podcasts. If you haven't yet, open your podcast app and follow this show. Join us next week for another gathering of support. Thank you for listening. If you or someone you know is struggling with mental wellness challenges, contact your doctor, NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or both. You can reach NAMI's helpline at 800-950-6264, Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time, or email at info at NAMI.org. Volunteers are working to answer questions, offer support, and provide practical next steps.